Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at 9 a.m. And if you're in the neighborhood, love to have you come on by join, and join us at 5383 Martin Street here in Harupa Valley. Good morning, Diana. Glad you're here. Good morning, Deb. <laughs> All right, let's grab our Bibles. Highlighter, cup of coffee, sit down, and let's just share heart to heart. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we come before you on this Good Friday. We thank you, Lord, for getting us through the week, Lord, and for your grace, Father. May you minister to us through your word, Father, and just prepare our hearts, Lord, as we uh, begin the weekend, Lord, as we uh, come to Saturday, Father, and uh, get some rest, do some yard work, some honeydews on our list, Lord, or, or come and just pray and seek God uh, Saturday night at 6.30 p.m. here at the church, Lord, and prepare our hearts, Lord, for Sunday as uh, every pastor will be preparing a message, Father, and that message is a message from God to that specific church and what uh, God wants to, them to hear and to be doing, Lord. And so, Father, we give this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Morning, Patty. Glad you could join us. All the way from Olanche. All right. My favorite place. That's where the that little breakfast place is. On the way to Bishop. It's a good place. So, All right. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, in my Bible, I have a Nelson study Bible. And I've had this thing for whoo, probably tw over 25 years now. Um, got a lot of notes in it, but not a whole lot. But in my Bible, it says, Giving No Offense in the Ministry. That's the title, theme of the first 10 verses. Giving No Offense in the Ministry. And I read that and I thought, how do you not give an offense in the ministry? <laughs> because you're going to offend someone, right? Truth always offends. And in fact, it's usually those that are not obeying the truth that are offended. The ones that are obedient are the ones that are not offended, but they're like, yeah, that's the truth. We should all be doing that because they're already doing it. <clears throat> so how do you as a minister, as a father, as a wife, as a servant in God's church, how do you present truth in a non-offensive way? That's really difficult. So let's look at what he says. He says, we then as workers together, I would underline that, the word together with him also plead, the same word that we see in verse 20 of chapter five, where he said that we're pleading, that Christ is pleading through us. So we also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. So we then, as workers together, now he's talking about the apostles, about the leadership, about the pastors, about the elders that are teaching the word of God. Uh, they're working together. Now, truth is truth. And we all should be teaching from the scriptures uh, clearly what God has already said to us. We shouldn't have new revelation. It's interesting how someone will come along and, and they'll say, I saw something new in the scriptures, something that nobody has ever seen before. I was praying and seeking God, and all of a sudden he just showed me through the Spirit of God. And yet, you have great commentators uh, like uh, Chuck Missler, like Warren Wisby, and, and others that have read the scriptures, and they all come up with the same uh, interpretation. And that person there says, no, they have been wrong. They can't see it. And so I'm going to share with you what God has shown me. But here's the thing that we have to remember. <clears throat> Peter tells us that there is no private interpretation of scriptures. There's no private interpretation. Uh, we are not going to come up with something new and different. We're going to come up with the same thing. We might say it differently. We might apply it differently in various scenarios and might be relevant in a different culture differently, but it's the same truth because God's scriptures are not of private interpretation. He gives us all the same interpretation. So we're all fellow workers together. 
We work together. And for one, <clears throat> I appreciate all the work that my brothers and sisters do in Christ Jesus here. I can't do it without them. I can't run the men's ministry, the family's ministry, the couple's ministry, you know, the women's ministry. I can't do all of those. I just don't have enough time in the day. And then yet alone t study for two studies or in a week and then the men's study that's, that's coming up. It's just, it's overbearing. And I appreciate those that are helping me to do those things. God raises those people up to do it. I couldn't run the Calvary Cares ministry. We, we did the best we can for a long while, me and Randy, with other people, but it's not until God raises up somebody that says, hey, God has called me to this ministry, and they, they take on this responsibility. They look at it as, this is my ministry. God has given it to me, and they go full board with it, and I encourage that with anybody. So I'm one that appreciates uh, those that are helping in the ministry. But we're not to uh, receive it in vain. Vain means worthlessness. God has given us the grace and the grace to be in that ministry and the grace to run the ministry. And so we have to uh, work as hard as we can. And then he says in verse 2, For he says, that is God, In an acceptable time I have heard you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And so for every one of us, there was an acceptable time. We were in the right place at the right time, and our hearts were, were ready to receive the gospel. And God saw that, and he shared the gospel with us, and we received it. And Paul here is saying, but today is the day for everyone. Right now, as I'm reading this, you might be listening on Facebook, and I'm telling you, today is the day of salvation. And if you have never received Jesus Christ into your heart and, and truly repented from your sinful ways, then today is the day of salvation. You need to confess Jesus as Lord. You need to put your life in his hands. You need to surrender, and then you need to begin to walk with him. You need to pray. You need to seek God. You need to read his word. You need to go to church. And you need to go to church and you need to get involved. These are things that will help you in your growth with Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, today is a day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. Boy, that's a claim right there for Paul. <clears throat> and yet he's being blamed, isn't he? <clears throat> because the Corinthians, Timothy found out, were talking about him. And this is why he's writing this letter. And so they're blaming him. They're saying things about him, and possibly they're all lies. And Paul is saying, we haven't done anything in our ministry that, that we would find blame. Can I say this? That if you are following God's prescription for ministry, you're not doing anything wrong in ministry. If you're preaching the gospel, then preach the gospel. There's no wrong way of doing that. I remember, um, I don't remember exactly who it was, but I believe it was Moody who was preaching the gospel <clears throat> and he was sharing to a crowd. <clears throat> and this lady said out loud, I don't like the way you're preaching the gospel. And Moody turned and said to her, well, how do you preach it? And she says, oh, I don't. He says, then I like my way better than your way. <laughs> At least I'm preaching the gospel. You know, there are so many that complain about ministry they complain about this and they complain about that but are they doing anything here for about it are they doing something no they're not doing anything um, i'm trying to think of complaints while i'm i'm talking i can't really think of too many at this moment i'm sure there's a lot but i can't think of uh, too many but that's a, a good way of answering them back you know i don't like the way they're running the children's ministry oh well how are you running it oh no i'm not involved well then they're doing a good job right? They're doing a good job. I don't like the way they greet me. Are you greeting somewhere? Are you, how do you greet? No, oh, I don't greet. Well, then I like the way they're doing it. At least they're doing it, right? So we can apply that to anything, to anything. So he goes on, says we don't have to be blamed, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in such patience, in tribulation, in need, in distress, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labor, in sleeplessness, in fastings, uh, by purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, 
by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left hand, by honor and dishonor, by evil reports and good reports, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastised and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. Wow. <clears throat> Isn't it interesting how <clears throat> someone can come to you and complain, and then shortly afterwards someone comes to you and actually thanks you for what you're doing? You ever have that happen? Where someone complains to you and then someone comes along and says, wow, thank you for doing that. I've had it from my messages. I'll have someone come up to me and say, that was an awful message. And then shortly after, someone will say, that was a great message. It really ministered to me. And this is what Paul is saying. You're having those people who are persecuting and tribulation and trial and all of these things and saying things to you. And then yet you're having people coming saying that was a wonderful message. That was a good job. That was this and that. And so that's the ministry. That's the ministry. I think the question is, uh, who are you? Who are you being? Are you the person that's complaining? Or are you the person that's encouraging? And we need to encourage. We get enough discouragement in this world. We need to be Christians that are encouraging one another in all these things. Now, we know Paul, in the last chapter, suffered a lot, as he uh, mentioned it very clearly, how much he had suffered, you know, being pressed in and all so forth. And now he's reminding the readers again that all of these things, the dishonor, <clears throat> you know, the long-suffering, uh, the evil reports, the deceivers, and the unknown stuff. This is this is all part of ministry, and yet, yet the opposite is true. There's great blessings in the ministry itself. And so we see both sides, and then he says, "O Corinthians," he just with an explanation point just says, "Oh, you Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us." but you are restricted by your own affections. We're restricted by our own affections. <clears throat> Is God to blame about our struggles and trials and our problems? No. No, not at all. He's not to blame. We're to blame. The things that we go through are our own <clears throat> results from our choices, unfortunately. God is good. God is pure. He's holy. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They're so much higher and further than we can even imagine. And so we can't blame God on anything because he comes from the actual truth because he is truth. He comes from love because he is love and he can't do anything other than that. So it's not him. So if it's not him, who is it? It's us. <clears throat> we have to examine our lives and see where am I at, Lord? How am I responding? Why are these things happening, Lord? Is it because of my decision-making? Have I put myself in that? So for whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And if you sow to the flesh, guess what? You're going to reap to the flesh. If you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap from the Spirit blessings and honor. But if you sow to the flesh, then you'll have corruption. You'll have struggles and problems. <clears throat> and this is why Paul says we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of the air. We're in a spiritual warfare, and oftentimes we're fighting ourselves. We're battling ourselves. As Paul said here openly, you're not restricted by us. We love you. We want to see you flourish. It's interesting how, how as a pastor, I, don't, I try not to restrict people, but there are, there are things that need to be done in ministry that have to be covered. And I have to deal with those things if they're not being covered, if they're not being taken care of. And when I deal with those things, sometimes people feel, you're restricting me. No, I'm not restricting you. You're restricting yourself because you're not doing them. Do them and I wouldn't be there. You know, I don't, I don't, and just to give you an example, I don't deal with the Calvary Care Ministries very much. Yvonne takes care of it. She runs it. I hardly even know what's going on with it except so that she gives me reports uh, periodically, but I'm not involved. If I'm involved in a ministry, you have to ask yourself, why is pastor always involved in my ministry? 
well, then you have to ask yourself, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And if not, then you need to start picking up the pace. You need to make sure you're getting everything done. You know, if I'm coming to church, which I shouldn't be doing, but and I'm looking around the grounds to see that everything's covered, you know, that's good. And if I see everything's covered, I don't have to say anything, right? And if that continues, it'll go for months. You'll never hear anything about the grounds because it's getting covered. But as soon as something's not covered, hey, can you make sure those are out? Oh, oh, oh pastor's looking again. No, that's not the point. Something was missed. It needs to get done. And it got pointed out. It's not pastors looking again. It's, oh, I missed that part. I need to make sure I get that part, right? And then pastor won't be involved. I don't know why we don't get that. You know, we take offense to it because we're, we're very uh, prideful people. We don't like people telling us what to do. But yet at the same time, um, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. So as Paul said, we restrict ourselves uh, because of our own affections. Now, in return for the same, I speak as no children or, or as two children, you also be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what have what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness. And then he goes on and explains a little bit more. And what accord has Christ with Biel? Some contrasts. And what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what gar agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are all the temple of the living God. As God has said, I dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So now Paul is saying here to the Corinthians, he says, I'm going to speak to you as little children. Now, parents do this with little children, right? They look at their children and they say, who are you hanging around? What kind of friends do you have? <clears throat> when you're at school, what kind of friends are you with? Because these friends are keeping you from doing your homework, from listening, from learning, and you're hanging around the wrong people. You need to be equally yoked. You need to go find some friends that are listening to their teachers, that are doing their homework, and that are advancing. Those are the people you need to hang around with. Hopefully they'll encourage you, rub off you, and you'll do the same thing. Paul is saying to them, I'm speaking to you like little children. It's interesting how as adults, and I see it all the time, people who are Christians, and they call themselves Christians, they will get into relationships with the opposite sex who are not Christians. And they think, well, I'm in love with them because they have this attraction. Uh, they might have some common ground, but it's an unequally yoked position. And God is saying you cannot be unequally yoked. But we're adults. We can make our own decisions. I remember I shared this with uh, somebody. I won't tell you who it is. And they said, well, God's not giving us a commandment there. He's giving us a suggestion. I go, really? It's not a suggestion. It's a commandment to follow. He makes it very clear. He even explains it further so that we don't miss it. You know, what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Nothing. What does a temple of God have in common with idols? Nothing. Nothing at all. It was the idols that destroyed the third temple in Ezekiel, in Daniel when God destroyed and sent Babylon in there and they wiped it out because there were idols within the temple itself. It was idols. It was a worldly things. And I wonder, I wonder if we're letting the world come into the temple of God today. Are we unequally yoked because we're using marketing, marketing to bring people into the church? I know we all do. We all do. I know all churches do. I know as a pastor, you look for ways of reaching out to the people. We have Facebook, we have websites, we use advertisements. I used an advertisement where, where they would, and I've been using it for years, um, <clears throat> they would send mailers to people that move into the community, new. Since they're new, they might be looking for a church. So as soon as they move in, new address, you know, it hooks, hooks up with the uh, post office. And, and the post office then sends out the mailers to that person. So they get it. Oh, look, here's a church. We can go try it out. So that's a way of reaching out. And people... Churches use them all the time. And we've been using them for years. But you know, I've never seen one person come to church because of it. So just recently, I decided I'm canceling it. It doesn't work. I'm spending a lot of money on something that has not worked. 
And, and that's a worldly marketing plan, right? That's what the world does. And the more you market things, then the more you have the opportunity to possibly reach things. The best way for the church to grow, it is the best way, and probably the way that we should be doing it, is by the sheep. Pastor Chuck said it all the time, that if you feed your sheep, and you feed them well, and you love them well, then sheep will beget sheep, right? Sheep will go out and say, I love my church. I'm a part of my church. I give to my church. I support my church. I'm there for my church. Uh, when there's events, I'm there at those church events. When there's cleanup time, I'm there to clean up. I love this place. You should come try it too. And I think you'll love it too. Sheep will beget sheep. The responsibility isn't on the pastor. The church thinks it is. They think that it's the pastor's responsibility, but it's not. It is the sheep's responsibility to bring other sheep to the body of Christ. But we use marketing plans, we um, use advertisements, we use you know, slides with great pictures, uh, we use modern technology as light shows so that we can put on a concert like the world puts on a concert with the, with the smoke you know, and the lights flashing and the guitars and even so recently where the musicians are now dancing you know, they're there with the guitars and they're jumping around and dancing like you would on a stage and the, you'd have the backup group and all of that stuff. You know, I just, I long for the days again when it was just a guitar and a worship leader. I remember those days. Those were such simple days where you just worship the Lord and it wasn't all the light show thing. You know, but we get unequally yoked. Uh, we see God's temple and idols. Now he ends with this. And it's a commandment, and it's very clear that we're to separate ourselves from this world. He says in verse 17, Therefore, come out. Come out. I heard those words many times as a little child. When I would be hiding from my mom, and she'd say, Come out of there right now. And I wouldn't come out. And she'd say it again, If you don't come out of there Right now, I'm getting my sandal, and I wouldn't come out. Okay, that's it. You're not coming out. I'm coming in, right? We've heard those words before, and God says, come out from among them. Who's them? The world. The world. Be separate, says the Lord. Who's saying it here? God is saying, and he's quoting from Jeremiah 31, Isaiah 52. Very clearly, God wants us separate from the world. He wants us to come out of the world. He says, come out. And he, then he says this, do not touch what is unclean. We've heard those words before. You go into a store, especially if you're, you're, you're kind of shopping like at a novelty store and so forth. And your mom says, don't touch anything. Because if we break it, we buy it. It even has little signs on all the shelves, do not touch. If you break it, you got it. You know, so Christ says here, do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. Now, the implication is what? If I'm touching something unclean, he will not receive you. There's a separation there. He says, I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. What a promise that is. If we totally separate ourselves unto God. The word surrender gets used quite a bit. Here's the reality, guys. Here's the reality. This is the reality. God loves us. And he wants us to come to him. And to embrace him. And to surrender our lives to him. He wants us to leave our old world. And join his new world of life. That's the reality. And when we do that, he says, I will be your father and you will be my sons Amen. and daughters. That's a great blessing to think about. And he will take care of us. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word and the reality of its truth, Father. May we humble ourselves before you, Father. May you give us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness and for your word, Lord, that we may know your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to take some time and pray right now. 
And so if you'd like some prayer, please post it there on Facebook or private message me if you don't want anyone to know. And we're going to pray here at the church for you this morning on this Friday. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. And if you're looking for a church and don't have anywhere to go, please come join us. We'd love to have you here. God is moving in a great way. Have a wonderful weekend.